many of you have seen the movie Apollo 13? Anybody? Anybody raise your hand? Okay. All right. So this movie, Apollo 13, for those of you that may have not seen it, is about the actual real-life event of Apollo 13 that was launched on April 11th, 1970, to go to the moon. And on the way there, they had some, some issues. Like that Houston, we have a problem. I think that's from a different movie, but it's similar, right? And they have these issues where part of the ship, that, well, the lunar module was supposed to be the part of the, the rocket that landed on the moon. Well, they had an issue with some equipment uh, that, that kept their oxygen together, basically. And they had a little, just a little explosion in space. <laughs> Any explosion in space is probably really scary. But it made it so that their oxygen was leaking out of the ship. Obviously, especially in space, we might need some oxygen while we're up there, right? So these guys, they, they get it stopped, and they realize that the problem is they don't have enough oxygen, one, to even think about landing on the moon, and two, they don't have enough oxygen. They can, well, the, the amount that they have is enough to make it halfway home. Halfway. And they're just supposed to hold their breath and swim the rest of the way, I guess, right? But so halfway home, this is some pretty grim news. And Gene, this gentleman, you're going to see his picture in this dramatic scene in the movie, Gene Kranz is an aerospace engineer, and he's the director of flight operations, so he's in charge there at NASA at this time, and he's working alongside a bunch of other engineers, and he's like, hey, we got to figure this out. There's no way we are going to leave these people in space or not get them home. So he says, this is not good enough. Half the oxygen, just enough to get halfway home. So we need to find a way to squeeze every bit of oxygen and energy that that ship can that muster to help these people. And he ends his little speech with them with this as he says, failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. So, good morning. My name is Rick Flynn. I'm the campus pastor here at St. Paul CJ, and I want to welcome you. If you're a guest with us here today, we're especially glad you're here. We just love the fact that, that at least for me, I, I feel the energy of the room, and, and, and people are starting to come back and, and be in the room. We've got lots of people watching online, and we want to welcome you guys as well. But it is such a, I don't know, just when, if you guys remember when COVID first came out or first started here, we shut down and we went online only, and I, I, I preached to empty chairs. I may have told you this before, but the chairs that you are sitting in are saved and holy chairs. I'll just tell you that right now, okay? So you feel, feel comfortable about that, but uh, it is great that, to welcome you guys here. We do have a mission, and our mission is to lead people to an act of faith in Jesus. We do that by, by loving God and loving others and serving the world, but we really kind of boil that down into all of us. We just want to love like Jesus. We want to serve like Jesus. We want to teach like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. That's the whole goal of what we do here. So we are glad that you're here. And I just want to maybe pray really quick right now and just say, God, would you move in us today? Stir our hearts so that we may be active and moving in the world for your good. Amen. So as we get started, I just want to give you, you know, how many of you watch uh, like Grit, uh, what is it called? Binge watch a bunch of Netflix movies, right? And as you skip and, or go to the next show, it always pops up and you can skip the preview. You can't skip the preview here. There's not that button, right? But this previously on. So here's previously on St. Paul CJ. We're in the season of Lent, right? 40 days of Lent. And this is to prepare us for the coming of, Christ. well, actually, the, the Easter, the, you know, when Christ comes out of the tomb and the tomb is empty. We prepare our hearts, uh, and we intentionally kind of go through the wilderness, so to speak. We're basing all of this off of the, the, the story about Jesus when he was in the wilderness and how he survived, and he came out of the wilderness and emerged on the other side stronger than ever, full of the Holy Spirit, ready to start his ministry. And what we hope and we believe is that we can do the same thing. We can emerge through our wildernesses. Whatever that may be for us, we can get through it, and that's what we believe today, that we can emerge stronger. So today we're going to continue our message series, and we're going to look about or talk about, uh, well, the, the title of our series or this sermon today is Failure is Not an Option, because it's not. 
So we, there's this thing, uh, uh, the survey that went out that was talking to people about what are your greatest fears? What are your greatest fears? Kind of think about that. You know, besides, my wife, spiders. I, I mean, I don't know how many pieces of lint that I've had to step on because she thought it was a spider, but that's one of her greatest fears. But the question was posed to 65 different people across 18 different countries. And their answers included things like being alone, losing a loved one, um, I don't know, just not being accepted, but there's one kind of theme that kind of floated to the top. And here's Laura from Florence, Italy, and she said, my greatest fear is that I won't have enough money to support myself and retire eventually. Kate from Australia, she answered, being a failure and a disappointment to both others and myself. Mary from Japan, she said this, my greatest fear is to look back and regret not having done something because I was afraid. And then lastly, Jessica from Boston, I fear that I will always be a laughingstock. And then one other I would add is my, I asked my brothers, and their biggest fears is that they wouldn't be as good looking as me. But <laughs> I hope they're watching. So, but those are some honest comments, aren't they? I mean, this fear, not about me being good looking, sorry. <laughs> That, that this fear that we feel, or the fear of failure, is a real thing. We fear that we may fi uh, fail financially. We fear that we may fail in our relationships. We fear that we may even fail ourselves. We have such high expectations sometimes for our own self, right? Maybe we even fear that if we don't do things right, or if we don't live just the right way, that we are going to fail God. We fear failing God. And those are real, real, real things, right? Emotional things, hard things that hit us deep down deep. So I want to read a scripture today, and, and it's a little long, but it comes from the book of Matthew. And my hope is that, that, that it'll help us understand how to deal with the, feel, with the fear of failure. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew 25, or you can pull it up on your phone, uh, but the words will be on the screen. Like I said, it's a little bit long, but I want to read the whole thing to you. And that's, I, that's, Hank usually does a scripture reading, but I didn't want to have to do it twice today. So here we go, and just hang on. For, this is Matthew 25. Hear these words from the gospel. For it is it, as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. The one he gave five talents to, another two, to another one, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents, but the one who had received one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of the, those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over me two talents, and see, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not snow and, or snow, sow and I gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would, would have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For all those who have more will be given, and they will have an abundance. 
But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Nothing like a little bit of light Sunday reading coming Sunday morning, right? So here's the so there's there's some weird stuff going on in this passage, and probably the first thing I want to talk about is this this master slave relationship. He uses mas, the master uses his slaves to build wealth. And this is not Jesus affirming the practice of slavery, although some people probably have used this to justify it. But this was a common economic practice in this day and age, and and it would have been understood by all the people listening, right? Today we would call them teenagers, but. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, but so when we read this t- story today, we understand that it, that it is outdated and harmful and oppressive, right? We don't agree with slavery, and neither does Jesus. The other weird thing about this scripture is it, it contains a whole lot of judgment, right? A whole lot. Not just any kind of judgment, but the really, really bad kind, because it talks about we're having you know, the gnashing and grinding of teeth. Anytime that's in there, you know something's up, and it's really bad. But on one side, we have the, the grace of God, right? And here's, here's one thing. This talks a lot, this judgment about how we're supposed to fear God, and that God is this, you know, this guy up there with a, uh, you know, a magnifying glass that's zapping the ants, right? Raise your hand if you've done that. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that, <laughs> right? We have this fear of this God that is going to judge us and, and cast us out into the darkness. And there's a lot of that, that Old Testament fire and brimstone kind of preaching. I'm not that kind of preacher. Right? I am pretty black and white when it comes to some things, but I land on the side of grace because, because I read the, the Bible, and when I read this narrative, it tells me that, that, that God is a faithful God, a loving and compassionate God, and that's the gospel that I believe in, just so you know. But that doesn't mean that we get to ignore everything that we disagree with or we don't like in there or the scary parts, right? So this passage talks about uh, uh, giving more to those who have more and, the ta- and taking it away from those who don't. And, the, and that sounds like a God who doesn't care about the poor. So this passage is a little troubling to say the least, but because of these difficulties, like I said, we tend to kind of ignore that, maybe skip over that part and read through it really fast, but we're not going to do that. We're going to dive right in, okay? We're going to dive right in, so let's go. What we're reading here, first and foremost, is, is a parable. Now, what, what is a parable? Anybody? No, I'm just kidding. Raise your hand. Tell me. In the back? No, I'm just teasing. Don't say it. <laughs> a parable is a story, right? Sometimes Jesus would use stories to illustrate a point or to illustrate a principle. This is not a story about slavery, and this is not a story about investing in venture capitalism. This is a story about the kingdom of heaven. This is a story when we read it, like any other parable, we need to kind of slow down and think, okay, what is God trying to tell me in this story? What am I supposed to learn from this story? The master gives to three different servants. To one, he gives five. To another, he gives two. And to to the last guy, he gives one. And we wonder in the story, I've, I've read this, that, you know, just the word talents, oh, he's talking about my gifts and my skills and my ability, right? Maybe, could be that. But I think in some of the research that I've done, it, it, it's, it's a vast sum of money is what he's talking about. He's given them a whole bunch of money, an exorbitant amount of wealth that is equal to 20 years pay. Now, take a minute. What do you make a year? Don't yell that out, but multiply it by 20. And I just walk up with a bag of cash and hand it to you. Think about what you could do with this lump sum of money. What kind of things could you do with it? What would you do if you had that much wealth at your disposal, right? I was talking to Kathy about it this morning. I was like, man, we're going to pay off the house. We're going to buy a new, new Ferrari. I think I said Ferrari, didn't I? Yeah, I don't need a Ferrari. I don't know. It just popped in my head. But this gift was given to them, and it was entrusted to them. And the master leaves, and he goes away. So he gives them this amazing gift, this amazing overabundance of wealth. He says, here you go. Make something happen. And he leaves. 
And it says that he leaves for a very long time. So I look at this, and I think that he was gone for many, many years. And the servants had plenty of time to do with this money what they, whatever they thought was best with this gift, this talent. And w- now, the first guy, we don't know exactly what he did, but he took that $500 billion or whatever it is, right? I don't know what it would have been back in that day, but he doubles it. The second guy does the same thing, and he doubles it. And the last servant, though, because of his fear, because he's afraid of this harsh God that he knows that he sows where he wants to and he reaps where he wants to and he knows this stuff about him, instead of taking these talents and trying to do something with it, he's afraid and he buries his, head in the, or buries his money in the sand, does nothing. And when the master returns, the master gets mad and he's like... <laughs> Does this mean that the master is all about us doubling our money? Does God want you to double your money? Maybe, maybe not, but I don't think that's what this story is about, right? And if you figure out a way to double your money, let me know. But God is not a God about doubling our money. The point of this story for me is that he wants us to do something with this gift, anything. Just do something. That's what when we look at the, the, the servant that buried his money, he's mad because, look, I gave you all this stuff. I gave you all this talent. I gave you this gift, and you did nothing with it. Why would you waste it? This is an invitation for God's, for us to enter into God's abundant life, the life of grace that he has to offer us. So now my question would be this. This third guy, why, why did he behave that way? Why did he just bury the, the gift? Why did he hide it? And I think he may have had a little bit of a warped idea of who God is, the true essence of God. And he says he was afraid. He thought his master was harsh, so he hid it. And then his master comes back, and he's disappointed, and he says, you reap where you do not sow. I didn't think... I could achieve what you wanted me to. God, you gave me all this gift. You gave me everything that I have, all the blessings in the world you have given me, but I don't think I can can live up to your standard. Master responds by saying, then you knew me, right? You knew I reap where I, where I do not sow, and you knew that I harvest where I want to, and, and believe me, I will get what I want to get, and I'll get what's due to me, but after all I have given you, you failed to apply it or use it or share it in any way. I would rather have you done anything than just let it sit there. Then listen to what the master says next. He tells the servant, he's like, you could have at least just put it in the bank. I'd have got some interest out of the deal, right? Done something. And that's just a fundamental, basic financial thing, right? Most of us, except for you that have it in your mattress, right, would put it in the bank and get something out of it. You could invest the money and walk away, and you wouldn't have to do anything, right? But this master wasn't asking him for a great return on his money. He just said, hey, I'm giving you this stuff. Do something with it, anything. Just try. So the servant misunderstood the master is what I think, and he was afraid of failing, and in that fear, he missed out on all the blessings that the master had to offer. And the master wanted the servant to live in the master's joy and abundance, and God's message for us is one of grace, and we are to be stewards over this grace. We are to be stewards over the gifts that God has given us. That's the message of the story. It's not about being rich. It's not about doubling your money. It's not about any of that stuff. It's a story, and the premise or the the idea behind it is that we are to be stewards over the gifts that God has given us. And you can plug in whatever you want for gift, right? It can be money. It can be your talent. It can be the band singing. It can be building houses. It can be whatever your gift is that you are giving getting paid for it to do for the world for most of us, right? We take our gift and we use it to provide for ourselves and our families. But that's a God-given gift. And he wants you to use it for good. He wants you to do something with it. He wants you to share it. And that's a message of the kingdom of heaven and what it looks like to live in the abundance of joy. 
And in this kingdom, there is room for all people. It is not a fear-based gospel to, to avoid some kind of punishment. The gospel is free of fear and full of love. And because of that, I want to, to share with you three things. Three things that will help us deal with fear. And I, I guess I should ask, does anyone not deal with fear? Anybody? We all have it, right? All kinds of different fears. So the number one thing I want to tell you is, do not be afraid to fail. Be afraid not to try. I think I said this last week when, when Pastor Aaron you know, told me, he says, if you're going to fail, fail be. Go out swinging. Try. Do your very best out there, right? The fear of failure is often worse than the, than the failure itself. Being afraid to fail is often worse than the consequences of failing. That fear often prevents us from doing anything if we let it take a hold of us. If we let fear in, it will paralyze us, and sometimes it stops us in our tracks, and we won't even move. It's kind of like that fight or flight or, or, or freeze kind of thing in it that we have in, our, in ourselves, right? When we're attacked or something excites us, we're either going to fight, we're going to flee, or we're just going to freeze. And that's what happened in this parable of the talents. The servant was so afraid of disappointing the master, so afraid of, of failing that he didn't do anything, not even the simplest steps of, of putting the money in the bank. So I'm going to tell you about this man, and, and I'm going to mess up his name, but I think it's Jai Jean, and he put himself through what he calls rejection therapy. He wanted to build his tolerance for, for rejections. For, so for a hundred days, he tried to fail at something every day. Simple things like, you know, he would, he would ask a stranger for a for hundred bucks. Most, most of them said no, right? Uh, he would go to a fast food restaurant, and when he was finished with his meal, instead of asking for a refill on a Coke, he would say, can I have a refill on a cheeseburger? <laughs> they said no. You know, what he found out, though, is that it wasn't that ba as bad as he thought. He realized that the fear really had not, you know, he, he, he had nothing to lose. All they could do was say no, right? He was dressed in soccer gear, and, and he went to, to someone's house, and, and he, he just asked them, hey, they had a kind of a soccer net set up for their kids in the back, and he asked them, can, can I play soccer in your backyard? And they said yes, though. They were like, okay, go ahead. So he got to play soccer. You know, he, he spoke to uh, the, the manager at Costco, and he says, hey, can I, can I use the, uh, the microphone? I want to talk to everybody in the store. No, he said no. But he did buy him lunch, though, and that was kind of cool. This guy, he, he describes our fear of failure as worse than any rejection that we're ever going to face. And when we go through it, it's, it's not as painful after all because people really are kinder than you think. Most of you are, right? That was kind of a joke. Okay, whatever. So <laughs> don't be afraid to ask. I, mo I would assume most of you know that I'm not afraid to ask you to volunteer. I'm not afraid to ask for money. I'm not afraid to ask you to, you know, come and clean the church. I mean... I ask because, I mean, what, you're just going to say no, and then I'm going to end up doing it, right? But I'm going to ask because most of you say yes, and that's awesome. That's why we get an award from the school for volunteering and doing those things, because you guys say yes. It's not the fear of failure, so don't be afraid to ask. So number two is this, you will fail, but failure's not the end. We are people who will make countless mistakes in our lives, right, where there are no perfect people. None of us are. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand, right? There are no perfect churches, right? There are no perfect businesses. There are no perfect schools. There, nothing is perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. But what we got to remember is we are not defined by our failures. I have failed over and over and over at things in my life. We can learn from these failures and move forward. When, when asked about how it felt to fail a thousand times before he created the light bulb, Thomas Edison answered, I didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps, right? I'd heard, uh, heard it said this way that, that he said, I didn't fail. He said, I just learned a thousand ways not to make a light bulb, right? <laughs> whatever it feels like defeat, whenever it does, or whenever failure or rejection comes your way, just look at it as, as we have an opportunity to respond. It's not a dead end. It's, it's a turn in the road. It's an opportunity to learn 
okay, that didn't work. Let's try this. And the last one is this, and I believe this is the most important. Failure is a falsity. Failure is not true. The the word failure is defined as a lack of success or the omission of expected or required actions. To be a failure, then, means we are not a success. People and culture define what success is. And what we need to learn is who are we basing our, our criteria off of? We're basing it off our neighbor? What is that, to be like the Joneses or whatever, right? Is that what we're basing our life off of? How our neighbor's doing? How our friends are doing? But what we need to know is what is success to God? What does God think success is? God has done all the work to say that we belong with God. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he spoke these final words, it is finished. Then, or when Jesus ascended into heaven, he sits at the right hand and he tells us that he's setting by the Father. And what he's telling us is that I've already done all the work. You guys are good. I've taken everything. I have defeated this world. I have defeated death. There is nothing for us to fear anymore. Every failure that we could possibly face is not a failure. Not at all, because Christ has already given us the victory. Matthew 20, 28 says this, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as ransom for many. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom. That ransom means that he paid the price to free people from their bondage. The bondage of slavery or sin, he has already paid the price for. We are free of that. We have been set free from our sin and our failures and our disappointments and rejection. He has freed us. Even when we think we failed, we've not failed in God's eyes. Here's a big thing that that maybe when I told you I came home from the war and I sat back there on the back row and Maybe in the beginning, I was trying to earn God's forgiveness. And I volunteered, and I did this, and and I thought that I could, you know, be this great person and earn God's forgiveness. But I can't. We can't earn something that God has freely given to us. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. That's how much he loves us even when we think we failed. So that definition of of failure is not the definition we need to worry about. What we need to look at is the definition of grace, which is what? Undeserved favor. We don't have to fear God. God invites us into a relationship, and we get to be free. We get to be free. So I'm going to tell you a little story about myself. It is going to be hard for you guys to believe this about me. But when I was back in the Navy, some of the youth group said I say that way too much back in the Navy, but during my naval career, I, they have a, a fitness test. Many, many, well, all of them do, right? And this fitness test, you have to do uh, sit-ups and push-ups and, and the easy one, you just touch your toes. I can still do it, see? And then there's one <laughs> where you, um, you have to run a mile and a half. And as the years progressed, I used to, no big deal, you just get out and run and you do it, but I could max out the push-ups and get 100, you had max scores, 300 points, and I would do 100, push, or 100 push-ups for 100, whatever it was, 100 points in push-ups, 100 points in setups, And then I would just pass the run just to get by, right? But it got harder and harder and harder, and I think it was just the years of pounding on my knees and maybe the years of pounds that I put on, but it got really, really hard to run and pass that test. And I couldn't, if you failed, I mean, then they put you on remedial PT and they made you run like almost every day and it really sucked. Not that I ever did. Can I say that in church? I'm sorry. (laughs) It was terrible. Um, (laughs) But being in the Navy, they expect you to know how to swim. And I will throw this out there that there's a lot of people in the Navy fitness or in the uh, boot camp, you have to jump off this tower in the the water and, and tread water for so long and then get out. There's a lot of people that join the Navy that can't do that test. They just sink right to the bottom. I never understood that. But in the Navy, we have an opportunity to uh, swim. You can swim your, instead of running, you can swim it. And I thought, why not? Let's try that, right? It's supposed to be better for your body. 500 meters. I didn't even know how far 500 meters was. It was a back and forth a lot. So I thought, well, I'll just start. I dove in the pool, it's practice, and I start swimming. 
And I, I don't know how to flip like that guy. I'm not Aquaman. or Who's that guy that won all the, the uh, medals? <laughs> Phelps. Yeah, I'm not Michael Phelps, right? I'm not eight foot tall and big old web hands or whatever, fish boy. But um, so I start swimming, and you only have so much time. And I would fail that swim test before I even swam 250 meters. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. They told me it was easy. Oh, swimming's easy. You've been swimming as a kid your whole life, right? And I did it over and over and over, and I'd fail and fail. I never once got 250 in the max time you get for the 500 meters. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm, I'm done, right? So it's PT time or physical fitness test time, and I got to go run this test. And I do my max push-ups. I do my max sit-ups. I touch my toes. And I get on the line. I'm like, oh, this is the one. I'm going to be running every day for the next six months because you do this test every six months. And I take off, and I realize... I can breathe a little bit better, right? And I'm doing okay, but I took three minutes off my run time. And I didn't realize the whole time that I'm beating myself up because I was swimming and I failed and I failed and I failed, God was preparing me for my next challenge. And I was able to run. So I started in the Navy swimming quite a bit, and I, never, I still can't pass a stinking swim test. I don't know how they do it. That's why I'm not a Navy SEAL. I will tell you every now and then that I was a Navy SEAL. I'm not, all right? But... <clears throat> <laughs> so he, no matter how bad that had bruised my ego and I just felt down like I'm never going to be able to do this again, I was you know, getting a little bit older and, and I was angry and I wanted to sulk about it, but in the end, God was preparing me for what was to come. So in our failures, we tend to beat ourselves up, don't we? Let me suck my gut in a little bit more. I did, you didn't see that, did you? Right? We tend to beat ourselves up and we, we fear what the world is going to say, but, but God doesn't do that. God loves us. And in our failure, we are received by his grace and his love and his forgiveness. We are invited into a life of abundance and joy with God because with God, failure is not an option. For today, that's the good news. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.